Hello everyone, my name is Christian. Welcome to my hobby blog. Today I'm very excited to be doing this special episode today with returning guest Will. We are doing a George Romero complete ranking, including some of the films that he has written, which I haven't seen all of them, but I think that'll be fun regardless. But uh, first, uh, welcome back, Will. Hey, I'm happy to be here. You've been Thanks on a me. lot of uh, appearances lately. <laughs> so... For those who don't know, he's been involved in disconnected uh, live streams lately, and they have been absolutely fun to watch. I've learned a lot. It's just like I'm back in class again when I'm watching those announcements. But uh, what else have you been doing lately since you've been on? Yeah. Here? Well, uh, so I'm still promoting uh, the Toby Hooper book, American Twilight, the cinema of Toby Hooper, uh, which uh, has been out just about a year now, and um, we're hoping to um, hope, hopefully we'll get to a paperback edition. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what the press depends on sales. So uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how that goes. And uh, I've been working on two different Wes Craven projects. I can't really talk much about those because um, though those projects are not yet complete, but. Uh, if things go well, there'll be a couple of um, titles uh, in the next year, um, collections of essays and whatnot on, on Craven. Um, just had a piece uh, come out in um, Chris Woofter's edited collection, uh, Shirley Jackson, A Companion. So if anybody's into Shirley, reading Shirley Jackson, as they should be. Um, this book of essays is, is really good. Got nominated for a Bram Stoker Award, which is pretty Ooh. awesome. Um, and then the, the thing that's most recent and I'm really excited about, um, there's a book series that Tom Weaver um, edits called um, Scripts from the Crypt. And <laughs> vo vo Volume 12 just dropped Todd Browning's Revolt of the Dead. Uh, so this book includes the unproduced script, original script of Revolt of the Dead, which was a zombie-based movie that Todd Browning was going to do, and several essays on Freaks, Mark of the Vampire, uh, my essays on The Devil Doll, uh, which is a bonkers movie that everybody should see. Um, so if you have any interest in um, Todd Browning or classic horror, uh, this book um, is really good. And, you know, um, it's, it's, it's written for popular audiences. It's not a bunch of academic jargon. It's just, um, really exciting book with great collections of stills and behind the scenes photographs and stuff. So Todd Browning's Revolt of the Dead. That's the brand new thing that, uh, that I'm pimping right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a director I need to get more into cause I've seen freaks maybe 102 times since you showed it in class and i haven't been able to find really any others but i also haven't looked too hard because a lot of them are i guess lost or really hard to find on blu-ray so yeah well kino has released several of his films on blu-ray uh several of the silent films hmm. uh drifting white tiger um you can get the wicked darling um and then Warner Archives has DVD uh, releases of several of his best silent movies, including The Unholy Three with Lon Chaney. That is special. Uh, and the, and his, uh, you know, these movies are all during um, really the peak years of silent cinema. So uh, for people who are maybe less interested in watching silent movies because they tend to be slower paced and whatnot, this is when they were fast. This is right before... Uh, sound came the blackbird uh, also with Lon chain really good uh, and then some of his talkies are available like the devil doll with uh lionel barrymore um fast workers with um john gilbert um miracles for sale which is a kind of black comedy um yeah there's well we're talking about george romero today <laughs> i'm drowning another day um, yeah but, <laughs> There are, there are some available uh, if people are interested. Yeah. Um, I'll definitely keep my eye out for that because I'm really enjoying the uh, American Twilight right now. I've kind of been using that book as sort of like a, I guess, guidebook for everything Toby Hooper. And I've gone through 
a lot of his early stuff so far. I'm waiting for TCM2 from Vinegar Syndrome because I haven't seen it yet. So that's one yeah. I think I really need to see. But Wait, did you just say you've never seen it? Nope. <laughs> oh, man. I've been well, meaning to. I just haven't been able to. <laughs> well, you know, in American Twilight, that's one of the movies I write about. So uh, uh, that's great. Actually, I'm going to be on uh, a podcast the cult film companion podcast and, mm. and uh, several weeks, uh, maybe it might not be till October. I don't know yet, but uh, we'll be talking about, it'll be a deep dive into Texas Chainsaw too. So uh, I'll let you know when that's happening. Awesome. Well, I'm really excited for today. Cause again, we are doing a George Romero ranking, which yeah. it was just um, a few months ago that I finally saw it the final movie that I hadn't seen by him, which was The Dark Half. Uh, mm. That was just one I never saw, and I'm very excited to show where that is on my ranking. But I guess let's first discuss what we love and appreciate most about George Romero. I'll let you go first as the guest. What we love and appreciate most about Romero. Well, as you know, I, I taught a course, a teach course on Romero, uh, which, which you took. And, um, you know, he was really, when you talk, when you talk about that group, the masters of horror, right? He was really the earliest one, right? He was 68, it's Night of the Living Dead. And he really busted open the doors, uh, well, in a way, artistically, right? Uh, economically, yeah. economically, there was still a long <laughs> way to go for independent, um, uh, genre directors, but, you know, uh, 68, uh, you know, it was four years later when Craven came out with um, with um, Last House on the Left, uh, and he also did so much for independent filmmaking um, in general, regional independent filmmaking, because you know they, he's coming from Carnegie Mellon and and um, working in industrial films in, in the Pittsburgh area, and then just starts making independent films and sets up with John Russo right there in the Pittsburgh area. Um, uh, so from an from a production context, I appreciate him as a as a independent filmmaker, a trailblazer. But as a filmmaker, my God, um, uncompromising, had a had a, a set of themes that he just was obsessed with and hammered on uh, over fifty some years. Um, you know, never. He, he went the, the major studio route a couple times and, and managed to preserve most of his vision in those, in those films, Dark Half and uh, Land of the Dead, uh, but uh, pretty much stayed independent. And, um, and uh, I just, I love his movies, humor, their cynicism, their, which can coexist. There's the cynical and warm. You know, like he never lost an optimism for humankind, <laughs> um, even even as even as he was very realistic. Um, and I uh, just, yeah. Uh, well, as we go through the films, I think I think the stuff that I love about him will come out. What about you? What what draws you to him? For me, it's his vision for sure. I love his themes that he has throughout all of his all of his films, mostly communication breakdown. Yeah. Um, that's probably my favorite. Uh, I did a big George Romero day yesterday. I rewatched uh, Night Riders, um, Day of the Dead. Uh, I'm looking at the stack here and Diary of the Dead. I watched all of them plus the special features. So I learned a lot about Romero uh, throughout yesterday. But for me, I love his crew that he works with. Uh, they're very consistent. Every now and then, one or two of them will leave, and another two will join, and they're just as talented. But I think the people who he surrounds himself with, it's just like magic happens. Even for some of his movies that not a lot of people either know of or like. So I just love everything he does. Even I think his bottom two movies that I have here is mostly just... Um, how I felt immediately after watching the movies, but for the most part, all of them are from good all the way to uh, near perfect, if not perfect. So yeah. some directors have like, 
the really bad movies and then the really good movies. But George Romero starts from like good and then to really good and to perfect. <laughs> so at least for the movies that don't work, at least you can really see his craft. So I try not to hammer on his bad movies too much because you still see a lot of, uh, I guess, vision and creativity coming through. So, Yeah. And for viewers out there uh, who are maybe looking for objective uh, analysis, this ain't going to be the show. <laughs> These are two fans. Um, and ranking is hard because I, I, can't, I can't even really rank them in terms of best to worst. It's really more if I have a stack of these movies and I'm going to pick one to watch, which ones am I most likely to come back to over and over? Which, which I guess in a way is, a, is, a, is an assessment of quality, but it's, it's also very subjective. Um, uh, and uh, because we've you know, immersed ourselves into his entire filmography, you can't watch one without thinking of all the others, you know? Um, which, which to me is the mark of a real artist. You know, there are a lot of, I mean, most directors, and this is not a knock on them, but most directors, if you didn't know from the credits who directed it, you wouldn't be able to tell, right? Because, because most directors are just craftspeople who are, who are um, doing the, getting the, sh getting the shot, moving on, putting the movie together, trying to be entertaining. And that's great. Uh, a lot of a lot of the very best movies, especially of the studio uh, system, system years, um, are made by kind of anonymous directors. But someone like Romero, just like you know, Orson Welles or Jess Franco or or uh, you know Agnes Varda, <laughs> <laughs> right? The personality comes through, and uh, and that's really special. Yeah, for sure, because I was thinking about that while watching Knight Riders, and I was just thinking about how the editing is very George Romero-like, which I love his editing, too. You can tell just from the way he shoots his movies and how he cuts a scene that is George Romero. Yeah, and that's... Romero's, Romero's editing is Romero-like. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess we can jump into the pre-ranking of what we think okay. about his films that he has written. And those yeah. include Creepshow 2, Night of the Living Dead 1990, and Tales from the Dark Side, correct? Are there mm -hmm. any more? Well, and all, so Tales from the Dark Side, the movie, and then he wrote uh, four episodes of Tales from the Dark Side, the series. Okay. I knew I was missing one. <laughs> but I've only seen Creepshow 2, so I'm going to let you kind of take the helm on this. I have it Creep flipped, show but <laughs> I also oh, have that. <laughs> Great, you got the alternate artwork. Okay. Um, well, when you talk about Creepshow 2, The Raft, that's it. That's the best one, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, a, a triptych, I believe, right? It's just three? Yeah, three stories. Um based on EC comics, just like the original creep show. And, um, definitely the raft, uh, which is described as a group of horny teens wishing they'd read the warning signs before taking a dip in a remote lake. And that does not prepare you for what's going to happen. Um, that is a, uh, a gore fest, a cosmic horror, um, um, pummeling <laughs> the experience of watching the raft is uh, one that will change you forever um, I like the other episodes the hitchhiker old chief woodenhead but um, but the raft is uh, so intense and strange and gross that it kind of overwhelms the rest of the movie. <laughs> and it's also scarring because I don't think anybody who has seen that movie will ever get in just water like that, that you can't see the bottom or there yeah. are parts of the lake or body of water that is out of sight. 
because I know I refuse to go in any time. I always think of the raft. It, I think, scarred an entire generation and continues to scarred. <laughs> but I do love uh, old Chief Woodenhead. I think that's a perfect intro sequence. It's not like mm -hmm. the best like the raft, but has a great lead up into that. And plus you get um, George Kennedy, which is always mm -hmm. fun. So you know, it makes a nice little social statement as well. Um, which is which is cool. Now Michael Gornick, who direct who actually directed this, I'm pulling him up because I want to see what other credits he has. And I guess he must have worked with um, he worked mostly in TV. Did four episodes of Tales from the Dark Side. Did some S Stephen King stuff. The Langoliers as a producer. Um, and he acted in Martin. Amusement Park Crazies and Dawn of the Dead. Um, it did a lot of crew work, camera operator on Night Riders. So he was part of he was part of the and DP on Day of the Dead, Creep Show, Night Riders, Dawn of the Dead, and Martin. So this is this is part of the, it's part that, of the troop. <laughs> troop that you were talking about. Um, uh, yeah, so it's a fun movie. Um, don't have a lot to say about it beyond the raft, though. Yeah, I honestly. I was reading the description. I was like, yep, the raft. I know that one. Old Chief Woodenhead. I know that one. And the last one, the Hitchhiker, I have no recollection of. I can't remember what happened. And, I, and I've seen Creepshow 2 like three or four times. And I saw this growing up too. This may technically be one of my first George Romero movies, but. Oh, I do remember that. It's a, <laughs> it's a businesswoman and she, she has a hit and run while she's trying to get home at night and um, he keeps he keeps uh, coming back to life and she like she gets so uh, so distraught that she eventually tries to kill him and just pummel his body and he keeps popping back <laughs> and, uh, and so she can't get away from him. yeah that was pretty good I, remember that. I have no yeah. recollection you describing it I'm like yeah that happened I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to talk um, about the others real quick next you've got tales from the dark side the series which ran for four seasons um, 1983 through 1986 and then tales from the dark side the movie uh 1990 um which uh included um uh screenplays for one of in the movie, uh, Romero wrote one of the, the four inter interwoven stories, and he wrote um, four episodes um, of the series. Now, I gotta be honest, Tales from the Dark Side is not a great series. Um, I was wondering. It, <laughs> it ran on, I think it ran on CBS, and it, it you know, you, you're gonna compare it to Tales from the Crypt, right? Well, Tales from the Crypt ran on HBO. So there's a difference in the kind of content that you can show. And some episodes pull off the suspense and the spookiness and everything, but um, it kind of, it does pale in comparison to Tales from the Crypt. And, you know, they're both inspired by EC Comics, um, though Tales from the Crypt, or Tales from the Dark Side, um, um, kind of veers into um, less campy territory and goes for more gothic, but, you know, low budgets and, and, um, uh, and, uh, just uneven episodes, you know, um, which is always true of anthology series when you have a bunch of different directors, a bunch of different writers, but, uh, um, some episodes are really good. Um, I particularly like the circus, which he wrote in the 1986 season. Um, yeah, you know, so, it's worth, especially for Romero Completus, it's definitely worth uh, picking up and watching, you know, the 25 minute episodes. Um, you can, you can, um, I'm sure you can stream them somewhere, but you can get the physical copy for a pretty, the complete series pretty cheaply now. DVD only, we don't have a Blu-ray release. Um, Tales from the Dark Side, the movie is quite good. Um, has a great, uh, framing story that featuring Deborah Harry from Blondie uh, and Videodrome. Um, and um, 
has great cast, Christian Slater, William Hickey, James Remar, Ray Don Chong's in it. Um, it's pretty fun. So uh, I, I, I would highly recommend that. Scream Factory puts out a Blu-ray of it. Um, if anybody hasn't seen it, wants to, that's solid. I've seen that release a lot, and I never realized that he wrote one of the parts in it. So now I need yeah. to go get that. <laughs> so... And then I guess the last of this series, right? You've got some opinions on the 1990 Night of the Living Dead. I've never seen it. Oh, you haven't? Okay, so no. this is this is written and produced by Romero and directed by Tom Savini. I knew, I forgot that, but. And it stars uh, Patricia Tallman from uh, Knight Riders, uh, as well as Tony Todd, the Candyman himself. Awesome. Uh, he takes he takes the Dwayne Jones role, and in interviews. Um, Quite rightly, I think Romero uh, expressed regret over um, how he handled the, the Judith Day character in the original uh, 1968 uh, Night of the Living Dead, where she, her character basically became catatonic. Now, um, a lot of people have kind of debated her character over the years. Some have criticized um, Romero for uh, having kind of an um, uh, anti feminist. Um, um, streak in in how she was portrayed and the other women characters being more passive um others have said well of course she's catatonic she's she's the only one who's behaving rationally <laughs> and and just completely shutting down because the apocalypse is happening um uh, and she's she she just kind of lets it wash over her in the end um nevertheless uh, she wasn't um, an active character once she gets to the, the house. And um, uh, Romero said he did this kind of to make up for that mistake. And so Patricia Tallman's character is much more active, um, kicks some ass. Uh, and in fact, Tony Todd's character at times um, uh, kind of loses the thread and, and she has to, to keep him on task. Um, the action and gore in this, obviously, as a Savini production, a lot more gruesome, and and um, it doesn't have the same uh, bite <laughs> as the as as the original because it doesn't. I mean, I, I don't think any remake can ever recreate that the the, the feeling of of um, such an iconic picture that, that that lands at the moment in time that it does. But it's a solid remake. It's it's uh, it's a lot of fun to watch as a huge fan of the original too to kind of track the changes and think about it in the context of, of you know 1989 1990 this this different time in, in um, American history uh, and you know Patricia Tallman's great she deserved to get a role like that um, it's always great seeing Tony Todd um, there's other other great cast members too you've got uh oh what's his name from henry portrait of a serial killer oh the, um, the, the sidekick in that one shoot let me look it up how can i forget his name well that's the magic of google tom tolls that's right tom tolls is in it so he's <laughs> he's, he's a lot of fun too um, yeah, so I like Night of the Living Dead, the remake. Cool. That's my take. <laughs> I will check it out one day. That's what I keep telling myself. One day I'll watch it. I yeah. remember in class, I was like, I should watch that. And I still haven't. It's been five years now. Five and a half, <laughs> I think, because it was in the spring. But yeah, uh, thank you so much for covering that side, because I'm unknowledgeable <laughs> in that and his written stuff, so... Works really well. So as we get into the um, top, the, the the meat of the show, the rankings of the um, of the the films Romero directed, uh, I'll keep my comments kind of brief, just because there's like twenty um, uh, titles, and uh, I look forward to seeing where we rank the same and where we differ. So, uh, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so we're, gonna go, we're going. We're going least to least favorite to favorite, right? Yes. 
and I'll give mine, then you'll go, and then me, and then you. So okay. we'll have fun doing that. Uh, I guess spot 17? Yeah, 17. Um, this is one I haven't seen since class. I actually fell asleep while watching it, and I remember waking up and seeing the really great shot at the end. I said, that's a good shot, and then the credits rolled. And if you haven't guessed already, it is, I think, his last movie, Survival of the Dead. <laughs> I, I recognize that I need to rewatch it so I can fairly uh, sort of rank it, but I, I remember all those crossfades just really put me to sleep in the beginning of the movie where it's just constantly going from zombie to zombie. And I guess my brain just couldn't handle it that day. So I fell asleep. So that's my number 17. <laughs> Makes sense. So uh, I'm going to go with a tie for 17. Uh -oh. Can I do that? Sure. Will that, will that mess us up? Nope. <laughs> All right. And it's ironic because there's always Vanilla and Amusement Park were the two kind of lost films of Romero. And so it was such a big deal when we finally got There's Always Vanilla. And thanks to the efforts of the George A. Romero Foundation and Shudder, we get Amusement Park. So excited to see these both for the first time um, when they came out. That being said, I, I find them, and I might have been biased going into it because it was kind of put in our brains that these were his least accomplished films, not because they weren't horror films, per se. Um, amusement Park, in a way, very much is. Um, but just because they they don't quite have the punch that, that some of the other Romero stuff does. I enjoyed, um, there's always been a little the first time I saw it, um, and then after watching a second time, I was like, yeah, probably, I, I think this will be, be a while before I see the third time. Um, you know, kind of going through um, s some, some satirical um, bits about um, uh, 70s America, which certainly it's ripe for, um, made some interesting um, and sometimes less interesting formal stylistic um, experimental moves um, that were cool in some places, but a little too much in others. I think he did it better in other movies. Amusement Park, which was an industrial film commissioned by, um, what church commissioned him? Um, I, was think, it? I remember seeing uh, the Lutheran church. Lutherans, okay. Um, and, uh, it was really cool, but it's also not a narrative film so much as a as a as a public service announcement um, about <laughs> yeah. about lo about loneliness and aging. So it's I I, I loved it um, when I saw it and I found it so exciting, but it's also not something that I, I am going to return to. Um, um, partly because I'm getting old. <laughs> and I, don't, I don't like it. Um, I mean, Facing I got a demons. <laughs> I mean, I got a ways to go before I get to where that guy is, but uh, I'm I'm closer to him than I am to my students. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's those are my those are my bottom. Well, I have them slightly higher, but um, I will talk more about them because I have yeah. movies that I legit don't like. Uh, to discuss first those i say are just fine i can't put them any higher but i cannot put them any lower so my <laughs> number 16 the this one i'm pretty firm on i've seen it many times throughout my life because anytime i was like i want to watch a zombie movie this was the most easily accessible one and that's just because it was on tv a lot on just cable and that is, uh, I don't have a copy of it. I used to have a copy that came with Zack Snyder's uh, Dawn of the Dead, but it's Land of the Dead. I do not like it really at all because it's one of those movies where I can see where George Romero wants to be. And it's like so awesome, the what if. And this movie did come from his, his original script in Day of the Dead. 
uh, he talks all about it in the uh, documentary and the audio commentary, and it sounds fascinating. And I wish they would make that movie, just to be petty, but I, it's like on the cusp of being great, and my disappointment that it's not great is what prevents me from enjoying it. So I hear that. And Tom Savini is only a undead biker guy and not the makeup guy. So I wish right. he was the makeup on the... Oh, and they use a lot of CGI for all the kills. And I f have a feeling that was just because of budget and time. So, Because George mm -hmm. Romero, he never went main studio in this and something else. Uh, Doc Half, I guess, was only big studio ones. But I do like that it brought George Romero back to the public because... Uh, the remake Dawn of the Dead came out right before then. And he talks about in the documentary how that was the only way he could make another zombie movie was because of that movie, which is a shame, but it's really nice that he's back. So, I mean, we yeah. got a few more years. <laughs> well, we got three more. Yeah, we got three more zombie films as a result. Of course, so this is getting into my next survival <laughs> that is, is near the bottom for me. Um, in a way, I really loved what this film was doing and um you know a friend and i we were so excited when it came out it was one of the first movies to drop video on demand mm -hmm. so we and we paid like 30 some dollars to stream it <laughs> when it first came out um obviously the budget is much lower um he he he, he said that this is kind of a and it is a loose remake of the William Wyler, Gregory Peck Western, The Big Country. And the problem is he doesn't have the budget to do The Big Country. <laughs> He's doing The Small Island. <laughs> but it is an interesting kind of coda to, you know, this is his final film. And uh, no spoilers, but the ending is um, an appropriate one, uh, uh, given his longtime obsession with communication and cooperation uh, among human beings. Um, it is, it's kind of a Western and it's odd because it is a um, tangential sequel to Diary of the Dead, which was um, shot kind of like a found footage movie. Whereas this is a traditional um, shot reverse shot uh, movie, uh, but an, uh, side characters of Diary of the Dead, it's their story. Um, the, uh, the, the, the soldiers who rob the main characters in uh, Diary of the Dead are oh, the yeah. main of the Dead. I totally forgot that. Yeah, and that's, <laughs> that's kind of neat, right? You know, you you follow uh, each character's story. It could have been it could have been Romero's slacker. You know, you just keep following different characters. But uh, yeah, so it's 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 near the bottom. I, I don't revisit it very very often. Um, I do like it, but it's certainly not my my favorite by any means. I've always wondered, does it come with a commentary track? Did he ever do one? So I would love to hear his thoughts on it. I don't want to yeah. watch the movie on its own again, but like if I if I could hear him talking about it, I'd, I'd watch it again. Well, you're in luck. <laughs> you're in luck. There is a commentary track. Perfect. So I'll keep that on the list. I guess it's my turn. Yeah. Uh, I guess I rearranged my ranking on the bottom. But um, now I'll, I'll go ra back with my original ranking. The next one is uh, There's Always Vanilla. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. I think it's interesting. But actually watching the movie is not fun. Because the man and the woman just talking in a chair. And I highly recommend the uh, supplements on this release. This was actually one of my first videos. That and Season of the Witch I think I reviewed together. Yeah. And I talked a whole lot more about the special features than I did the actual movie. It's okay. We're now at the point now where everything is just okay in this section of my ranking. It's not <laughs> bad, but it's fine. I have to say, you are probably the only person in the history of Romero fandom to rank There's Always Vanilla higher than Land of the Dead. <laughs> I don't like Land of the Dead. <laughs> No, that's, that's I, I I see the movie that could have been, and I just get angry and disappointed. <laughs> that's that's legit. Um, interesting. Okay, well, here's my next one, and this okay, this is probably the first one that's gonna 
result in an audible reaction from you. My my next one on the list, of, I'm still in the kind of bottom uh, third, is Monkey Shot. Oh my god! Okay, that is a whole lot higher for me. <laughs> you know, and I was surprised uh, too that it, that it was this low. Uh, but then when I looked through the stack, I was like, no, well, I can't put it any higher because if I'm gonna if I'm gonna choose between two movies to watch. Every every other movie on uh, on the stack will come before Monkey Shines. It's I long. like Monkey Shines, huh? It's quite a long movie. I don't like the pacing of it. It it, it does have a slow pacing. Um, it is a, a really cool concept. I want to read the novel it's based on, uh, which which has been on my to do list for a while. I love the idea of um, of. Uh, the, the the restraining impulses of civilization um, beginning to come loose as a result of this psychic bond with with uh, with an animal um, and uh, one of the great final battle death scenes of any uh, movie ever um, I, I I do find this to be a much more entertaining um, uh, movie than it would seem to be from hearing the concept like i, I can't believe it got made because every, every time i think of the pitch i'm like what how could you raise money on this uh idea the novel was was uh i think a fairly popular one but um as, as a as a film how do you uh how do you raise money and explain how this is going to work visually and it does work um it's it's just not it's just not my favorite. <laughs> I will accept that. <laughs> no, but I think it's pacing is the main reason why it's nowhere near the top for me. It's like right I think smack dab in the middle for me. But uh, I mean I have a lot of fun watching it. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to I'm trying to do the spoiler free, um, which might be a mistake. But I figure I figure listeners might not have seen all of these and I don't want to ruin any movies that they haven't seen. Uh, you, you should watch every single one of these movies we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, dear, dear viewers. <laughs> <laughs> so is it your turn next or my turn? No, I guess it's my turn. You just showed monkey. So this next one is only because I rewatched it last night with the commentary on and it did not move at all. Cause I had this ranking done for the most part, but forgot about land of the dead. Uh, actually, until I sat down to turn the video on. But uh, this is what we've sort of talked about already, but it's Diary of the Dead. I oh. enjoy it as a concept of him kind of rediscovering the origin point of when the apocalypse started, but the characters all suck for the most part. Uh, I like that one sequence when they go to the farm, but that's about it. Um, everything else is just kind of like a hot monitor where it's like nothing, <laughs> nothing. But uh, I don't know. I think the acting, if done better, would have uh, improved the movie. There's some cool uh, practical stuff in it, though. Can't mm -hmm. say that about Land of the Dead. That's why it's high. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be mean. I don't mean to be dismissive, but I, I mean, it's okay. We're in the it's okay section. It's not bad. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well uh in the in the okay uh, section my next one is going to be the dark half yeah um yeah. i think that romero uh was fairly uh positive about his experiences in um uh in working with a big studio when talking about land of the dead Dark Half was a much more troubled production, and I think I think it's I think it's more uneven. Um, it it's a cool concept. I I tend to be less into um, Romero's supernatural um, like movies that have supernatural uh, elements to them, uh, just because I think he's such a visceral filmmaker, um, and there's some visceral moments in this for sure. But, uh, um, you know, this was not a hit when it came out, of course, and, and didn't, didn't do much for his career. Um, it's, 
it's fun in 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 when it's spaced out. It's not the, the like it's something I can return to every few years and and enjoy it. Um, but it's not it's not the movie that I would I'd like. If somebody said recommend a George Romero movie, who would never seen one. This is definitely not the one I would, I would go with. Very fair point. I have it a little higher, but I think this next one is one that can be re evaluated if i see it again this next one is again one i saw in class and i fell asleep during but i woke <laughs> up at the end because it's a very loud end and i enjoyed the ending so it's a it's um bruiser i guess it's too light colored on bruiser. the uh, poster but it's bruiser i enjoyed it i think in the first 20 minutes fell asleep woke up to the awesome misfits concert at the end and I said, yeah, because I was listening to them at the time. And I was like, this is great. And then the movie ended. And I want to rewatch it. That's one I'm, I guess, it's a lot lower than it would be if I had just rewatch it. But there's no good releases out there for it. So. That's true. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So my next one, uh, we're crisscrossing a little bit. Uh, here's here's where I rank Land of the Dead. Um I was uh, lucky enough to see this in theaters mm. um, when it came out. I saw it at uh, Multiplex in Withville, Virginia, um, a, a matinee showing. And um, I was so happy that Romero was back. Um, that uh, and, and I think this was the first, yeah, this was the first movie of Romero that I'd gotten to see in a theater. Mm. Um, because uh, during my teenage years um nothing got released in the theater except i think the dark half but i was i didn't even start i hadn't started watching movies at that time i think i was like 13 or 14 when dark half came out but i think my big problem with land of the dead is that it its message is too simple you know in dawn and day and night the the satire and the apocalyptic themes are nuanced and complicated and contradictory. But this one is straight up um, the George W. Bush administration, the war on terror, um, the, 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 the um, false pretenses of the war in Iraq, the, the, the racism of the class system, um, racism and classism, obviously, of the class system uh, is represented by um the soldiers and by um oh what is the character's name well i'll come with it but uh and and you know dennis hopper's character being so obviously based on um uh not just bush but uh but the um um not just Bush, but the, the whole like oligarchy of corporate America that now is represented by, you know, Trump and all that. Um, and, and I was like, right on, you know, uh, and my students always like Land of the Dead because it's the one that they totally get <laughs> <laughs> not having to think too hard. And that's, that's one of the reasons I don't like it as much is because you don't have to think as hard um, with that one. Cholo, John Leguizamo's character, Cholo. Um, it, it's it's I, I agree with its politics um, and you know if if, you, if viewers don't agree that's that's fine we don't have to fight about it um, but uh, but I, I I wish there had been a little more nuance to it um, uh, this one is more righteous anger and less um, melancholy and anger and 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 optimism as characterized as others as other stuff yeah i really like the tower too how on the lower levels yeah. are like the peasants basically where they're just like fine we'll let you have the first level but everyone who's rich and upper class is right on top because it takes the zombies quite a while to go up the tower yeah I mean, it's a cool idea i mean i just it's yeah. a it's a it's a yurtle the turtle situation right <laughs> If the bottom's unsteady, the top ain't gonna last. Yep. As we'll see. So what my, what's next? My next one is one that I think is 
good, but I don't think I'll watch again. Maybe unless they somehow find interviews with George and Mary about this, but it's the amusement park. Okay. I enjoyed it when I watched it. Um, I enjoy it a whole lot more than Diary, Land of the Dead, Survival, There's Always Vanilla, and Bruiser. But I can't go any higher. So I really like that Martin's cousin is in the movie. I forgot his name, but he's he carries the PSA video movie yeah. i don't know what to call it but he's great in it um it's terrifying it's a descent into madness it's very much a romero movie and when he's on the carousel and you hear hear like the re really weird discordant noises and it's going faster and the editing is all over it. like that's again as you were saying earlier you can watch amusement park and know that's a george romero movie so it's kind of amazing, you know. You're, you get this money from the Lutheran Church, and you're supposed <laughs> to make a PSA about aging, and you come up with this. I mean, um, <laughs> it's it's unsettling, and uh, and uh, I think it fulfills the charge, you know, just to be about loneliness and 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 um, and isolation. But uh, <laughs> I'm sure the church expected something a little different. Because <laughs> it starts off right off uh, with our main character talking about like elder abuse and you know mm -hmm. aging and all that, and you think, oh, okay, it's gonna have like random local actors walking down the street while a voiceover says, "I'm so lonely." But instead, George Romero propels this elderly man who walks in the tent totally battered, and you're like, "What happened yeah. with him?" And he's like, "Let me tell you," and it's just a descent from there on. So I, I really enjoy it, but I can't put it any higher. <laughs> well, speaking of stories that feature elderly characters, my next one is Creepshow. That low. Which is probably, yeah, <laughs> I realize this is probably lower than you think it's going to be, but I, I think it'll make sense as we continue. Um, another anthology film inspired by EC Comics. This has, of course, the great... Um, Stephen King performance where he says the immortal line, meteor shit. <laughs> <laughs> includes the incredible Ed Harris, Ed Harris dancing sequence. Um, a, uh, a, uh, a menacing performance by, um, was that Leslie Nielsen? Um, and, uh, and so many more. Hal Holbrook, Adrian Barbeau, uh, Ted Danson. I mean, this is a kick-ass cast. Um, it is, this is before the Tales from the Crypt show, and certainly um, it did the EC Comics Crypt Keeper concept um, uh, as well or better than, than the Tales from the Crypt show. It's a lot of fun. It's got scary stuff, disturbing stuff, gross stuff. Um, I love it. The package that uh, Screen Factory put together for it is just fantastic. Um, we are firmly into um, my rankings. Every one of these I just love and could watch any of them anytime. So that's that's where Creep Show is for me. Wow. Um, after this one, uh, maybe a little bit after that will be what I love and hire. There's still two more that I think are just great. Or maybe even good at the lowest, but this next one is one that I like a lot, and I love the uh, the commentary on here and all the supplements for this package. I've already reviewed it. Uh, I've said a lot about it already, but it's uh, Season of the Witch, and I have the awesome uh, artwork. But it was called Jack's Wives, and it first came out by George Romero himself. And then they rebranded it as Hungry Wives to chime in on the sexploitation. And yeah. uh, I've, because I remember we uh, covered this in class and you showed a clip from Belle de Joy, which mm -hmm. is a movie I've since seen. And I think about both of these movies at the same time, whether I've seen one or whether I'm watching one or the other. And I think it's very obvious the connection between the two, the great uh, double feature. So yeah. I really enjoy Season of the Witch. I think it's slow at times, but I really enjoy the witchcraft and 
the Satan worshipping that they do in this. So that is my, I guess, rank, I don't know, 11, 12. Okay, great. <laughs> 11. Um, uh, that, that's my number 11. I'm going to need you to hold up the cover for my next one. Uh, which is two evil eyes. Uh, as I was, I was telling Christian before we started rolling, I ordered the 4K version of two evil eyes from Grindhouse Video during their Blue Underground sale uh, about a month ago, and uh, but I pre-ordered it with some other stuff, so it hasn't come yet. Um, and I sold my Blu-ray copy. So two evil eyes is my next one, and I, I kind of waffled on whether I like two evil eyes more or Creep Show more. I think probably deep in my heart, I actually like Creep Show more. <laughs> and it's and it's kind of cheating because I'm including the absolutely bonkers Dario Argento half of uh, Two Evil Eyes, the uh, the adaptation of the Black Cat with um, uh, with uh, Harvey Keitel, um, and I just I don't know I found that film so unusual and so very dark and. Um, I'd seen it several times on late night TV, so I have kind of a nostalgia for it. I'm really looking forward to seeing the, the 4K, which I've heard is uh, really good looking. Uh, so, so that's where I am on two evil eyes. Awesome. I have it a little higher, but it's right there. Um, I think I love the Romero bit a lot more, but I think that's just because I'm a big Romero fan and I haven't seen it in a while. I saw it a few months ago, and I remember the Romero a lot better than Yargento. But uh, my next one, I guess number 10, is going to be The Dark Half. I remember nothing about it, <laughs> but I loved it. Uh, this is from here on out where in the I love these movies uh, section. So nothing bad about this one. Uh I wish I remembered more, but I mean, I love it. So this was the last Romero for years that I hadn't seen. Uh, since, basically, since I began film collecting, that was the one that I wasn't able to find on Region A. And when I went Region Free this uh, Christmas, that was kind of my present to myself as a Region Free Blu-ray player. And that was one of the first purchases I made. I finally watched it and... I'm now complete <laughs> on all oh, his directed movies. So, is, is the Scream Factory edition out of print or something? I had no idea Scream Factory did it, so oh, okay. I must so, have man. not found it. You I worked have, hard. For yeah, I didn't look. I didn't work hard to, for it, but because I mean, it's enjoyable. I just haven't seen it in yeah. a long time. But this is Indicate. No, Eureka. So, okay, that's well, likely a good addition there. If they do um, a 4K, actually, I'll upgrade to that. But. Oh, yeah. This is actually a good uh, connection to the next one I'm going to uh, pull up because The Dark Half is like several of Romero's films about the duality of, of man. I mean, and when I say man, I mean specifically um, males, right? About this kind of wrestling with um, uh, the dark, dark parts of. of um, masculinity and so my next one is bruiser Ooh. um which of course uh is also about that now i'm gonna i'm gonna um i'm gonna star fuck a little bit um to put it to put it genteely in in 2009 i believe uh there was a retrospective of george romero films uh, in charlotte north carolina um and uh, they showed several of his movies. Bruiser was not one of them, uh, but Season of the Witch was, and Knight Riders. Well, no, they didn't show. Yes, they did. They showed Knight Riders, um, and the Crazies, and Night and Dawn, and they premiered Diary. They did a midnight premiere of Diary, um, and a couple others. And um, George Romero did Q and A after every movie, and um, I I had a chance to ask him a question. And I asked him if he felt that Bruiser was the male version of Season of the Witch, seeing as how Season of the Witch was about this woman who was confined in her social roles as a, as a housewife, a suburban housewife, 
was stifled, was bored, was um, uh, unable to, to really be who she was. And this film is about a man who is constantly shit on, taken advantage of, put under pressure, um, simultaneously cuckolded and ridiculed, um, told that he should be both aggressive and um, passive. And finally he just snaps and he becomes this faceless uh, revenant. And uh, so when I asked that question and I kind of explained my reason, uh, Romero looked at me and he started laughing and he said, well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so that's awesome. There you go. <laughs> and he, he, he went into it for, for, for a minute or so, but, um, uh, yeah. So I, I guess I have a, a personal connection to the movie now that, that elevates it a little bit. Um, I like the coldness of the movie. It's one of his first that was shot up in Canada and he really took advantage of the, of the, um, the, the weather, um, which was obviously shot in the winter time and, and is lit accordingly. That's awesome. I've heard that story, uh, I think in class and I was like, what? I would love to see George Romero just in person, let alone have him acknowledge a question. And well, so guess, warmly too. Like you could have been the guy being like, "Do zombies use toilets?" or like yeah. some stupid thing, which is the main reason I don't go to cons because I don't want to hear those dumb questions. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got lots of idols I would love to meet, but I don't know. Uh, mm, I reshuffled these a little bit on accident, but I'll go off the digital ranking. This next one is one that I guess you hate with a passion. It's uh, Monkey Shines. <laughs> oh, I see. Some words in my mouth. I, I love this movie. I mean, I think there is a bit of a pacing issue where it, it feels like it slogs for like five minutes in the, uh, however long this movie is, an hour and 13 minutes. No, 113 minutes, so almost two hours. Yeah. Uh, again, George Romero is a snappy editor, and I think he could have snipped a few seconds here and there from each scene. But I think for the most part, I really love it anyways. It's such a simple poster. I remember seeing this in Blockbuster. Had no idea what this was, because I was probably like five or six when I was in Blockbuster. But this is a nice little movie. I really enjoy it. Um, I love... I love the uh, casting, the main guy, uh, Jason Beige, I guess. I don't know how to say his name, but something along those lines. Uh, he's great in it. He is so mean to his uh, very overbearing mother who is yeah. just trying to do her best. And he's, he's just so mean. And I don't know, that George Romero, he's, this is the first of the ones I love. So well, I guess I do love dark half but this this is family and the i love category <laughs> so well here's my next one now i i also got to see this one in theater and i went to the last showing uh of the night so it was like a 10 10 30 p.m showing i was the only person in the theater to watch <laughs> diary of the dead which actually was a big hit for him oh, um wow. and it's and it's what got him the money to make survival however little that was um I thought the concept was really cool, um, and it was kind of—it was really too early, because if if he could have made that in 2015, because it's it, it really is about social media, and 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 the kind of narcissism of the screens, and if he had been able to make that with TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and and uh, um, the the types of cell phones that we have now, because 2009, they're using film equipment. He's got a camera on his shoulder, but now you could just do it with uh, with phone cameras. And uh, but that being said, um, I found it funny. I found it disturbing. I found it inventive. Um, it really refreshed the genre. Um, it's one of the better. Um, I guess you have to call it a found footage movie. I mean, it comes to, I guess the idea is that the character is editing 
um, the footage together and narrating it. Um, so there's 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 uh, a little twist on the found footage um, genre, but uh, yeah, I, I really like Diary of the Dead. Yeah, it's great. It's just all the other ones after are just that much better. So I haven't I haven't been saying num- <laughs> I haven't been saying numbers, but I guess that's my number eight. Oh yeah, I've been going back and I've only said numbers for one of them. Uh, yeah. I guess I'm on number eight now. So about halfway now. This is everything from here on out is top fifty percent. Um, I must have really messed up my thing here upside down. This next <laughs> one is one you've already talked about. I really love the George Mero piece. This is Two Evil Eyes, number eight. Uh, I really love it. I love the little slip where it looks like it's raving at you. But um, <laughs> the Argento part, I love the, um, I guess, the atmosphere of it. I just have no recollection outside of the visuals out of uh, Argento's side. But I also haven't seen the super long list of supplements for this. I just got it. And I think the last Blue Underground sale. So mm-hmm. I need to revisit it again. So I haven't seen it in a couple of years. But uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy it quite a bit. Um, I don't have much else to add to it. Uh, yeah, well, we haven't even mentioned uh, that the, the Romero uh, piece of it is a Poe adaptation of the facts of M. Valdemar, which is one of Poe's le- lesser known stories, really. It's not, not mm-hmm. one of the... the big heavies um and it's really cool and it's it's kind of a it's a zombie revenant type of story with adrian barbeau and yeah it's 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 wet it's cold yeah. and wet. <laughs> i love it um uh, it's just been a few years so i i wish i was i wish i'd seen that instead of diary last night i <laughs> so i could have been a bit more firm in my opinion of it but mm-hmm. what's your eight or seven i think you're on seven I'm seven because I I put amusement park and there was only okay. a tie so uh, so even though you went first we're actually on the same one so this is my number seven um, you'll probably think this is a little low too but I I don't see how else I could do it um, Night Riders I completely understand it and I love I love <laughs> Night Riders I love that uh, Romero considers this his favorite film and, and it makes sense that he would. Because it's it it it's so it's mythological. It's also biographical, you know. Because in many ways, you could think of this as the the disintegration of his uh, partnership with um, with um, uh, Joe Russo and and um, Laurel, you know. Um, uh, Ed Harris is great in it. Tom Savini is great in it. Patricia Tallman's great in it. And so many, and, and you see so many um, Romero stalwarts throughout. John Amplis is in it, um, and it's great, you know. And people are always surprised when when they see it for the first time. They're surprised that they like it. Um, I think probably this is his truest, purest, pur- purest film. Um, in okay. terms of how he expresses um, the themes of communication and, and community. Um, and I just love it. On an entertainment level, uh, I rank a couple higher. Um, there's very little blood in this. Um, <laughs> so that's just a subjective thing. But Night Riders is my number seven. Do you want to hear my number seven? <laughs> I do. Night Riders. <laughs> Also, oh, wow. we lined up. Uh, that's shocking, actually. I didn't think we'd line up anyway. But Wait, no, I think that's your number six. Count. Uh, seven. Oh, okay. So this is my number seven. I am. I accept my wrongness. I just rewatched this last night with the audio commentary that had everybody on it. Uh, Christine Forrest, George Romero, Tom Savini, John Amplis, I think, shows up during it. Um and I learned so much because for the longest time, this was actually quite low. This was around where I put Season of the Witch, which was my 11. And that's mostly just because 
I think the jousting gets a little old for me, but listening to the audio commentary track and uh, I think they had a full length. Um, no, they didn't. Uh, that's Day of the Dead where they had a full length documentary, but the interviews on this disc are amazing. Uh, I love the crowning scene of Tom Savini uh, crying and everyone else is crying. And they talk about that scene on the commentary track and it's very wonderful. I definitely see why everybody involved ranks it as the number one movie because it sounded like a whole lot of fun to make. And this is the, I think the first movie of the three picture deal that the producer, um, let's see, uh, Salah Hazanine, uh gave him because after, I think, Dawn of the Dead, uh, Salah uh, wanted him to make the sequel to Dawn of the Dead because it was so successful. And mm -hmm. they interrogated and negotiated and settled on a three-picture deal. And Romero said, I'm going to make the one movie that I really want to make first and have the sequel be the last movie. So I have that really high budget to do whatever I want. And Knight Riders was the first one. And this is definitely his purest movie. I mean, it is. it has the cynicism, but it has the fun that you would expect a George Romero production to be. And Tom Savini is actually uh, a main character in this. He's always uh, kind of the back makeup guy who works his magic, but he gets to show his acting chops. In mm -hmm. this, and he is amazing as Morgan, I believe his character's yeah. name is. He's awesome. Uh, this would have been a whole lot lower if I did not rewatch it with the commentary. I still love mm -hmm. it, but it's really hard to go higher here. But mm -hmm. that is Knight Riders. I can't think of any other trivia to give, <laughs> but I fe felt really smart when I was finally able to connect why this movie is the purest and then, uh, I guess his next movie he made was Creep Show and then uh, Day. So, mm -hmm. why that's the golden age of Romero, in my opinion. Yeah. So, I mentioned that I thought that this movie kind of predicted the, the disintegration of Laurel Entertainment. I mentioned John Russo, one of the one of Romero's earliest partners, but I didn't mention Richard Rubenstein, the producer. Like and, <laughs> well, I, I bring him up because next on my list, you see this old DVD of Martin. The reason I don't like him. <laughs> um, well, I'll let you explain the reason you don't like him when you, I, I think you probably rank this a lot higher than I do. So um, you definitely should share. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love Martin like everybody else. I'm clamoring for a um, high definition restoration. I would love to see um, the alternate cuts that, that have been rumored. I, I'm, I'm unlike some people I won't be like devastated if I don't get to see um, alternate cuts because this is the cut that I know and I love it um, it's really a, a, a great quintessential 1970s experimental independent film about industrial decay the the disintegration of communities the um, you know, and, and I, I saw this growing up, and certainly we see it to some degree in, in, the, in some of the MAGA communities, the way resentment and superstition and paranoia set in to communities that have been devastated economically and culturally um, through bad economic policies and, and environmental um, devastation and decay. This is an all-time great vampire movie. John Amplis is, is amazing in it. Um, love Martin. So that's my number six. Yeah, awesome. Number six. It's not in my top three, but it's definitely in my top five, which I guess I'm on number six next. But I love Martin. Uh, I'll get more into that later, but... This next one, a lot of people, I think, will be shocked that it's as high as this, but it's my number six, and it is The Crazies. I love The Crazies. 
especially since I watched this last summer. Uh, and that was after the COVID pandemic. And watching this movie after that is very enlightening. Just seeing the same exact sort of, I don't even know, breakdowns of the process of avoiding the sickness where people turn into raging lunatics. Uh, we get Lynn Lowry in this movie, and she's great in it. Uh, she is wonderful. Uh, I think it's her best role, right behind Shivers. And uh, it is lovely. We, we get a lot of visuals that are similar to Nine of the Living Dead, of the uh, hunters going after the different people. We get a scene where someone lights themselves on fire. It's a very exciting movie. Very uh, cynical. Uh, very hard to watch. <laughs> but I love this movie. I haven't listened to the commentary, I don't think. But uh, the interviews on this disc are lovely. Yeah. So that is my number six. Well, here comes my number five. We're going right into the final. Now, I've got three different versions of this, and I'm about to go fourth. My number five is the Ooh. original. Night of the Living Dead. It's coming out in 4K uh, pretty soon from Criterion. Here's the Blu-ray from Criterion. I've also got the Joe Bob Briggs edition, uh, produced by Darcy the Mail Girl, which features the Joe Bob commentary. And... Here's one that is very rare. This is a comedic edition with a um, commentary joke track by Mike Nelson of oh, Mystery <laughs> Science Theater 3000. Mike Nelson's solo. Nobody else is with him. And uh, no visuals, no backstory. You just put it in. You can watch the movie regular or you can listen to it with Mike Nelson making jokes the whole way. And it <laughs> is hilarious absolutely hilarious um what what can be said about night of the living dead that hasn't already been said um i uh i i did get a chance to ask romero a question from the audience q a about this one too and uh um asked him if he had had any influence um uh or asked him how much he was influenced by german expressionism in the composition of the movie and he was like a lot <laughs> <laughs> and you, you can certainly see it in the interiors with some of the lighting but i also argue that you can see it in the in the um location compositions the long shots in the very beginning of uh the car you know coming to the, the the cemetery and you see power lines that are kind of crooked in the background and i i call it uh, i made up a term called uh, expressionist verite right um <laughs> an expressionist composition in, in natural location. Um, the social and political commentary of, uh, of the film, the way it was produced, all the great stories about how they, um, how one of the producers played chess with a guy at the, the printing lab to, to, to uh, uh, get, get a print for free, um, get the dailies. Um, Dwayne Jones's performance um just everything about my living dead is is amazing it's amazing that i got made and of course the 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 haunting story that romero used to tell about how they're driving up to new york to try to sell this movie with the film canisters in the back of the car and over the radio they hear about the assassination of martin luther king um which happened to coincide with king's um uh, sermons, um, at demonstrations on behalf of uh, workers' unions. He was beginning to talk about workers' rights. That's when they got him. You know, um, so all of a sudden it wasn't it wasn't just about equal rights. It was also about economic justice. That costs money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so everything about Night of the Living Dead. Uh, resonates throughout the not just film history but American history, and uh, I love it. Fifth most. <laughs> yeah. Um, after my next movie, everything's interchangeable to me. It's really hard to rank them, but my number five is going to be one you already talked about, and this is Creep Show. 
I really love it. Um, I haven't gone through the special features yet on this release, but uh, they have a new commentary with Michael Gornick, which is really cool, which I did not realize before recording this. I just looked down, there it is. Um, I would love to just rewatch this every other day. I grew up on this movie too, so there's definitely some nostalgia uh, kicking in here. I used to watch this on TV a lot growing up. Uh, I don't remember when, but I think it was the Stephen King story was, of course, the one I loved growing up because it was wacky, and I knew Stephen King back then. But uh, each story is just so good. I think I like The Raft the most from the second one, but I think what makes the first one better than the second one, in my opinion, is that each story is so good. That yep. it lifts everything up. I mean, even the final one where it's all the ticks and different bugs uh, in this guy's house is just so haunting. That's my worst nightmare. It's what I think about every time I walk into the apartment is, oh my gosh, what if I turn on the sink and just bugs start coming out? The way that they made that sequence is disgusting. I want to know more on how they did it. But uh, I love that John Amplis plays uh, the... I don't even know it's zombie. Uh, it's that guy, I think, Yeah. on top. Uh, mm. I had no idea that was even John Amplis because I only <laughs> knew him as Martin up to, up to that point because most of these movies I saw for the first time in class, but this was one that I was really looking forward to in class because I'd seen it and knew it well. So every time I watch it, it's just like that nostalgia feel you get was like you know every frame every line everything yeah so i love creep show <laughs> and now we're in my top four now so. all right well number four for me is day of the dead Ooh. and i i prefer it for entertainment purposes to night partly because even though this is un, uh, uh, this was under budgeted for for what Romero wanted to do, obviously the um, gore effects are landmark uh, in Day of the Dead. But also me personally, I, I really resonate with the critique of the military industrial complex and the pharmaceutical industrial complex. The idea that we are kind of trapped in these institutions and depend on their unethical behaviors to live the lifestyles that we live, right? Uh, the, the abuses of the pharmaceutical industry that provide us with everything from uh, aspirin to cosmetics depend upon um, breaking every kind of ethical and moral rule you can think of. Uh, the military industrial complex that, that um, props up the, the imperial adventure and uh, keeps us uh, um, comfortably clothed in uh, artificially um, depressed price, uh, uh, what's it called, fast fashion, um, among other things. Not to, yeah, not to mention the oil. Um, all of that is, is kind of seething underneath um, the experiments on the zombies who are being herded by the, uh, by the increasingly frustrated aggro uh, soldiers so yeah day of the dead is sweat and hysteria and i love it yeah i have a lot to say about it once once i get there but my number four is one that uh we've talked about but it's a martin i don't own a copy so i'm using the letterboxed uh little thing but this is one that is woefully underknown everyone who knows of it though though loves it and it is such like a punk rock type of movie if you turned off the audio and turned on any punk rock song of uh john amplis walking through the industrial uh wasteland uh it sounds as if he's in a music video and i love the yeah. settings of the movie i love the break-in scene where they uh where he walks in on a woman and her lover having sex and the lover thinks that he's the husband and so they have a couple few seconds of awkwardness and she just says no i don't know him 
and you you hear that George Romero sting and everything's off from there. I think that's the best uh, little sequence by Romero. But uh, again, all of these are interchangeable. So when I watch this, this will probably be my favorite Romero. But it's been a while, so this is at the bottom of my best top four. But the reason why I don't like Richard Rubenstein at all is because he is asking for a lot of money for this and Dawn of the Dead to be on Blu-ray, which we haven't shown it yet, but uh, there's a second site release coming, and that has been delayed for the last year or so because they have found a three-hour cut, a black-and-white cut of the film that I think Romero was uh, debating on having it be all black and white, and the studio said you can have some black and white, is my understanding. But either way, I think it should be available to uh, screen, because Second Sight has decided they're not going to try and argue anymore with Richard Rubenstein and just go ahead and just make the best cut, or b make the best uh, edition of it with the theatrical cut. Which I think is on its own very good and lovely. I haven't seen it since class because it's impossible to find. Mm -hmm. So the DVD is like 200 bucks, I think, on Amazon. You can't find it anywhere. It's insane. It's really hard to find. I need to take care of this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. that, that's my number four. But I don't understand. Richard Rubenstein 75 years old. Just take what you're getting offered, man. You ain't got much yeah. time. And especially um, the beginning of the movie is so scary. And I love the fantastical version that Martin has in his head. And then the actual reality of that intro scene. And what do they call it? The money shot at the end of that scene? Oh my gosh. Like, I, I would love to show my dad this movie because he's a big Romero fan too. And this is one he's never heard of. And I'm I'm going back and forth on showing him the 4K of it when it comes out because of that scene where yeah. he slits her wrist all the way down and bathes in her blood. Yeah. There's some fuck shit going on during that movie. It's really disgusting, but that's what I love. So, and his, uh, acting in the movie is so well done. And Tom Savini is amazing in it, uh, as a pre, as a young hip preacher. And he's like, Oh yeah, yeah, that whatever, elder this guy can deal with it and uh because uh martin's cousin doesn't like the young hip preacher so he goes to another old preacher while tom sabini is like yeah who cares like that's whatever i'm here to have fun and i also love the uh themes that you mentioned of the isolation and the decay because uh Martin's one person that he finds any connection to uh, is leaving town or is planning to leave town. And it's very kind of like we're rooting for him, but we also understand why she wants to leave and he wants to leave, but it's crazy. I can talk all day about Martin. <laughs> so what's your, I guess, number three? Or yeah, two? I'll, I'll have to speed up a little bit here, which is too bad, but I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to run soon, but. My number three is Season of the Witch. I got the alternate Ooh, art. wow. Okay, so um, high. <laughs> yep, and that's that's legit. I uh, And it is unusual. There's very little violence, and, and it's kind of a departure. It's about, you know, the main character is, is a woman. Uh, not too many of Romero's films really tell women's stories. But like I was saying with Bruiser, you know, this is very much a film about um, uh being trapped in these traditional social roles. Um, uh, I also really love, you mentioned the, the Luis Bunuel um, connection with uh, Belle de Jure, uh, the surrealism of this film. Um, I think that where there's always vanilla was experimenting with a lot of different techniques that didn't work um, totally well with me. This one works all the way through. I just love this movie. I love the atmosphere of it. Um, uh, I did. I got to ask a question about this as well to to uh, Romero. I asked I asked if he was quoting Bill de Jure, and he said yes. Um, and he said he didn't get that question very often. And so I felt really smart, like we were going to be friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 
Um, but he was very gracious in the Q and A, uh, and and uh, yeah, I, I was so I was so glad to get to see a film print of that on uh, in a theater too. So yeah, that's one of my. <laughs> so my number three is one that we haven't talked about. Uh, again, all of these can be interchanged, uh, interchangeable, uh, and this is of course the giant edition 4K of Dawn of the Dead. I don't know what else to add to the. I guess, <laughs> critique or love for this movie, but this is a good little release right here. I highly recommend Second Sight. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have full trust in uh, Second Sight for Martin. So it's it's sad that we, we're not getting the black and white, but again, I'm very happy with what we're getting. And there's also the fun Argento cut that has Goblin uh, going ham on the instruments, but that's my number three. And I can do my number two real quick if you want, since we've talked about it. Well, if you, boy, I'm worried about time. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. Stressed out. Fine. Well, I, I want to do my number three because, or my number two, I mean, because it's also a second sight. And the thing that I'm most kind of excited about in this set is the um, novelization, which Romero wrote um, with Susanna Sparrow. Uh, around the time that the movie came out and I've never gotten a chance to see this and I can't wait to read it. Um, and I had a chance to yet, but yes, everything that we've said about Dawn of the Dead that needs to be said has been said a great satire of materialism of consumerism. One thing that Romero said repeatedly was that television really screws with our heads because we see these opulent lifestyles and we begin to on an unconscious level expect these lifestyles for ourselves when in fact they're unsustainable they're a lie um the the the, the economic elite uh who who've managed to gain power usually through dishonest means uh live at this um live in these you know fiddler's greens um that uh and foment the the resentment and envy of the masses and um, I, I, I think that the shopping mall uh, sequence of Dawn of the Dead really uh, gets that beautifully. Um, love the movie. Love everything about it. Uh, Ken Ferrey lives forever. Yeah. My heart. <laughs> well, that's my number two. Woo. So my number two is, of course, Neither Living Dead. I love it. I saw this actually in theaters. Uh, not when it was first released, because I was, my dad was barely even alive <laughs> at the time. But uh, I saw it in downtown Durham, a cup like back when George Romero first died, and a week or two later they announced that they are having a free screening at uh, it's right across the street from the Durham Performing Arts Center. But it's in a pretty nice uh, mm -hmm. theater with giant chandeliers hanging right above you while you're watching the movie. And watching it there was so awesome. And then I think a day later, Criterion was like, okay, yes, we are working on a, a Blu-ray edition. So I had to woefully wait for many years, uh, for I guess half a year for it to be released. But that is my number two. I love it. There's not <laughs> much else to say. <laughs> and now after all that wait, you're getting a 4K uh, next month. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> All right, well, that brings us to the number one rankings. My number one, if you haven't already noticed, is the crazies. Woo. Now, you got to have both the Arrow edition and the Blue Underground edition because the Blue Underground edition has the George Romero commentary. Damn. Yeah. That's why I need um, it. You know, you kind of said it earlier. Um, COVID um, kind of showed us what just how accurate the crazies is. And The Crazies has been my hands-down favorite Romero movie since the first time I saw it on VHS in 1998. That was the first time I ever saw it. This was another one that I uh, got to see in the theater at the Romero um, retrospective. Um, and uh, at the time, I got to ask a question about that. And at the time, I, I, we had just had a scare with SARS, you know, and swine flu and stuff like that and and some minor things that happened 
And so I asked him a little bit about, you know, the, the socio uh, politics and uh, socio um, cultural aspects of pandemics. And he talked about it for a little while, um, which was, which was so cool. But um, yeah, this idea of paranoia and conspiracy and distrust and mistrust and inability to communicate and, and fear and how it drives everything. The irony of the ending, which I won't reveal for people who haven't seen it. Um, but also the fact that this, that the pandemic and the crazies was caused by um, unethical scientific and military behavior resulting in an accident uh, and a cover up. You know, and you and you saw a lot of the conspiracy theories around COVID, uh, some of which we still uh, haven't wrapped up. I don't even know which ones I believe and which ones are QAnon, um, or maybe I believe some QAnon stuff. I don't know. I don't know what the hell to think anymore. Uh, here we are. We're, we're talking over Google Meets right now, um, and this is kind of a product of, of the COVID pandemic, isn't it? I mean, we had these programs before, but but this kind of communication, um, just among friends and, and acquaintances was, was certainly not widespread at this point. This was more for international corporations to, to phone into meetings. So yeah, the crazies, it's freaking incredible. Love it. Okay. So now for my number one, it's only because I just saw it yesterday with the commentary and I watched the almost two hour documentary on it and it is day of the dead. I love this. Number this was one. in my top four anyways, so again, it's interchangeable, but uh, it is so nasty. It is disgusting. <laughs> uh, human nature is at its worst at this point. Uh, poor Joe Pilato. Uh, I heard a story on the documentary where they had unplugged the fridge where all the guts and everything was, and they <laughs> forgot about it for like two or three weeks, and they came back from wherever they were doing, from Florida, and they were like, okay, we're going to do the scene now. And poor Joe Pilato had to lay there with all these different guts for four hours, they said, while everyone had, like, masks and gas masks and all this thing because it had rotted. It is pig guts and blood. And I feel so bad for him. And he is completely understated by everybody in this movie. Everyone says he overacts, but he's not at all because oh. any, anyone who's left in the apocalypse especially in the military are going to be like these, like Joe Pilato. And yeah. I felt bad for him in the interviews. Cause he was like, I want to punch people every time they say that I overacted. And they only show that one scene. He says where yeah. he smacks yeah. the table. Yeah. 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 And he's like, no, like I tried really fucking hard <laughs> to be at the top of my game. And I think it really comes through. In he this was. movie. He's yeah, amazing. He I think people don't really, we're so used to these slick action thrillers where people are in insane situations, but are able to like react with one liners and stay cool and do backflips and, and, <laughs> and whatnot. Um, but these are people and they're hysterical. Yeah. And that's what happens. I mean, we've not experienced the zombie apocalypse. I get I get hysterical when I can't find, like, a tool in my apartment. Like, where's the fucking hammer, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and then I started thinking, if I find the hammer, I'm going to kill everyone in here with it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you know we, we lose our grip. And um, I, thought, I thought the performances all the way around in that film uh, were amazing. Um, in fact, movies like Land of the Dead, I think, are, are, are less realistic as a result. Of course, the, the zombie apocalypse has been going on for some time, so you expect them to get more used to it, I guess. But uh, Day of the Dead in particular, the pressure cooker is on. And the tiny sets, too. Like, mm, yeah. they, uh, the main actress had to uh, leave, I think, at one point and just like sit outside because she was claustrophobic. And oh, I also want to shout out John uh, Amplis in this movie because I had no idea he was the doctor this entire movie yeah. for many watches that I've seen it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there he is. So, yeah. but that about wraps it up for us today. Uh, this was so much fun. It was so nice to finally uh, go through all his films again. 
yeah. and to also talk with you again. This was a lot of fun. Oh yeah, it's been a while. I'm so glad we could schedule it. And listen, I want to I want to plug um, for anybody out there. Google the George A. Romero Foundation, um, which uh, holds Romero's archives. Um, take a look at their website. There are uh, video tours and all kinds of information um, about all the preservation work that's going on there. Uh, these are the folks who helped restore amusement park. Um, so the George A. Romero Foundation, or GARF, that's actually what people refer to it as. Um, <laughs> check, check it out. And uh, check out all the Romero films you haven't seen. And uh, Christian, thank you. We got to do this again soon. Yeah, definitely. And for those uh, wanting to know more about Will, I'll have a lot of links and such in the bottom where you can click and check out any of his writings, such as Jess Franco, Toby Hooper, uh, all of that. So thank you all for watching.